my goodness, I'm a bit intimidated when someone calls me Mr. Brown. Holy cow. That just means I'm old. But I didn't feel old when I went to school. And I thought I, I was very comfortable, actually. And I went to school and thought, gosh, this just, the biggest concern I had when I first started and as I was going to BYU is I thought, we're all going to come out of this with about the same GPA and about the same experience. So how am I going to differentiate myself? And my wife and I, we decided, well, well, let's go to Shanghai. Let's do something different. And it's changed everything for my life. It's changed everything. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today. And it's going to be really hard to stand here to do it. In October of 2008, actually specifically, it was the summer of 2008, Beijing had the Olympics. Do you remember that? Summer Olympics. Pretty impressive show. Just before that, there was a big earthquake. And 50,000 people died during that earthquake. One of the young men who actually survived was in his school. He was only eight years old at the time, and his name was Lean Howe. And Lean Howe got out of this rubble. He got out of the building. And at eight years old, could you imagine what that would feel like? What would be your first inclination if you were eight years old and you were able to get out of a building that had just collapsed all around you with all your classmates in it? What would you want to do? What would you do? Call my mom and dad. Call my mom and dad. Just get somewhere normal, right? Tell me something's OK. But Lean Howe, he didn't do that. In fact, what he did is he, he went back in the rubble and he started pulling kids out. He started pulling kids out of the rubble. And then he realized there was other kids. They were trapped in the rubble still, and he couldn't get them out. And at eight years old, he went back into, the, into this dilapidated building, if you will, and he started to sing songs to them, trying to comfort them for hours and hours and hours until rescuers could come. And later they asked him, he said, Lean Howe, why did you do that? And Lee Howe simply looked at me because, because I was the hall monitor. Wasn't that my job? Folks, what we're talking about when it comes to leadership is not the title. See, a title may put you in front of the room, but it is not why people listen. It is not the standard. And, and, and frankly, if you've ever seen or worked with someone in leadership who thinks it's all about themselves, isn't that really inspiring? Isn't that fun to work with someone like you ever work with someone you do not trust? Now, I know that for some of you, you think back to summer campuses or maybe a, an experience where you might have done something. Have you ever worked or, or even lived with someone you do not trust? Is he sitting next to you right now? That person you do not trust? How does that impact our performance and how does that create our experiences for us? What I'd like to share with you today is, more importantly, how emotional intelligence and the way we relate with each other will impact everything you do in your life. Google, two years ago, did a really ambitious project. But they wanted to find out, what is it going to take for our Google engineers to be the best leaders to take us into the future and to be able to stay competitive? Interestingly, Dr. Wernick and I have both had opportunities to spend time on their campus and spend time with their leaders. And it's interesting that what they did is they took 10,000 of their performance reviews, so all these reviews to tell them how they're doing in their work, and they took 10,000 and they put them in an algorithm. I'm sure some of you would be able to come up with a similar algorithm. I would not. But they did. They put them in an algorithm. You're ready, right? Sign me up. I'm in. But they put it in this algorithm. And they wanted to find out what are the characteristics that really pop out in terms of our great leaders, our really, really great leaders. And what are the things that aren't so great in terms of leadership characteristics? What are the things we don't need anymore? What do we need in our leadership that is different than those who are just doing the stuff on the front line? Now, it doesn't mean that being on the front line is a bad thing. But they were looking specifically for how are we going to move forward with leaders that will inspire the people around them. So after they did this, they took these 10,000 interviews and they qualitated and they found, they found some characteristics that they liked. Then they did some back checks with it with some interviews, 400 of them to be exact. And then they found eight characteristics that really, really popped out as the differentiators for leadership. Of the eight characteristics, only two of them had anything to do with their ability to be an engineer. Six of the characteristics had everything to do with their interpersonal skills and their ability to relate to other people, their ability to connect to other people, their ability to coach other people, their ability to inspire other people. I bring up these stories for a reason. Because leadership, and, and too often, let's be honest, we have seen examples of leaders that really don't inspire. In fact, the people who show up in the newspaper and then end up in jail, typically because what? They served themselves. 
at the expense of everyone else. What we get to do today is different. I want you to have a conversation for just a moment. Would you indulge me? With the people around you, I want you to ask this question, or ask, answer this question for yourself and for the people around you to answer it for themselves. What is your higher purpose? What is your calling? What is your higher purpose? What drives you? When you think about leaving this school and going out into the workplace, what will be part of that higher purpose? You might not have a clear answer for all of it yet, but I want you to begin that conversation. What is your higher purpose for being here and for what you'll ultimately be doing when you leave? Please, I'm going to turn the time to you, to the people around you. What's your higher calling? or at least you feel like you have a foundation for what that purpose is. How many would say, yeah, I've got a purpose and I've got a feeling for it? Okay, so it's quite a few of you. For those of you who are still on this journey and still trying to figure it out, don't, don't throw this question off quickly, all right? Clay Christensen is one of the well-known professors of the world. He's actually number one in leadership, thought leadership, according to the Financial Times. And they rank the financial and the biggest leaders and guru management leaders of the world every year. And Clay Christensen happens to be of the LDS faith and teaches at Harvard. He wrote a book called The Innovation Dilemma and inspired Intel to change the way they did business in order for them to remain competitive. Recently, he wrote a book called How Will You Measure Your Life? And in it, he reflected. He said, I went to school with a bunch of students who had all the potential in the world. And frankly, let's be honest, those of you who are sitting in this room will probably make more money in your life than anyone else on this college campus. Cool. <laughs> Most of you will make more money than anyone else on this college campus. If you want that, if that's your biggest purpose. Now, I'm not saying that that it can't be a great purpose, but I, I, I would like to invite you to think about what Clay Christensen said in this article, which became, by the way, one of the number one articles at Harvard for last year, which is why he wrote the book which is why later I interviewed him to get specific answers on what he thought. And he said, I went to school with all these people with amazing potential and started out with the right ambitions. We all knew a lot of stuff. We learned great things. But he said, now, as I look at my alumni, and as we get together with the alumni, many of his classmates have since gone to jail. People that collapsed huge companies and cost billions of dollars in devastation and destruction because they forgot their purpose. They forgot their purpose. It's one thing to declare a purpose, it is a whole other thing to do something about it. Is that fair to say? Lean Howe knew his purpose, would you say? Eight years old, and he knew that being the hall monitor was his job. So the number one thing I'm asking you to do today is think, what is my higher purpose? For me, it's a calling. What is that calling? Because that's bigger than a job. It's bigger than a paycheck. It's bigger than just paying for a mortgage or trying to live some dream. The biggest opportunity most of us will have will be to serve the people around us. The biggest challenge to that is that as we become more educated, as we become more financially secure, and as we get promoted in our ranks, which will inevitably happen, we also tend to become more arrogant, 
more egocentric, more self-serving, and less inclined to do anything for anyone else. In fact, most leaders at the very top become so insular that the biggest reason why they fail is because they become so arrogant they don't understand all the blind spots around them. The most successful leaders today that continue to lead is because they're willing to listen and learn. They have a sense of curiosity, a sense of curiosity that actually serves them very well. And I ask you this today, when you think about how you treat the people around you today, what would the people around you say? What would the people around you say to the way you are around others? And I know this might sound a little bit like a devotional, but can you believe that I actually spend my time at General Electric with the most high potential players six or seven times a year talking about this very same message? The last week I was with Intel talking about this very same message. That next week I'll be with Zappos talking about this very same message. That the next week after that I'll be at Southwest Airlines talking about this very same message. I tell you that because this is the bottom, the foundation of where we're at. It is easy to become arrogant, it's easy to become self-centered, and yet it serves no one, even ourselves, if you get in that trap. Remain curious. So I've asked about a calling. What is your calling? The second one is curiosity. So in 2004, Sally and I were living in Shanghai, and uh, I, I was doing some work for a group in the middle of Siberia. In fact, I was closer, I was closer to, well, I was closer to Siberia. I was actually in Inner Mongolia, but I was closer to Siberia than I was to Shanghai at the time. And I was walking the streets of this city, waiting for my flight before I had to go back home, when this little girl, she just came up to me and she started rubbing the hair on my arms. And I thought, wow, she's very, very brave. <laughs> and I thought at the time, now, what if I just thought this was all about me or if I just didn't want to talk to people? I might have lost a huge experience. Also, I thought, wow, how curious she is to want to just come up and see who is this guy with all this hair on his arms. And so she looked at me, she goes, Wa say. Any Taiwan or Chinese speaking missionaries out there? Any mature missionaries out there speaking Mandarin? So he said, Wa say, you make about trench. I was like, Gu Shang or Bush Zani Toshang. What in the world is all that hair doing on your arms and not on your head? And she was concerned. And I thought, this is a serious question. So I sat right on the ground. We were right on the street, dirty place, and people going left and right, and lots of things going on. We sat right on the ground, and we started to chat. She was fantastic, five years old. And she said, what was it like to live in North America? So we talked about it for a while. And I said, would you ever want to go there and see it for yourself? And she said, well, no. I said, well, why not? She goes, well, I wouldn't like the food, duh. <laughs> Come on, you're five years old, you got an opinion. I said, what about Shanghai? Would you want to go to Shanghai and see it for yourself? And she said, no. And I said, why not? She simply looked at me and she said this. She goes, why would I want to go anywhere else if I'm so happy right here? Why would I want to go anywhere else if I'm so happy right here? My invitation and my question here is this. Where you spend your work time, the majority of your waking hours at some point, is going to be a really important decision. Now, it doesn't mean that your first job is going to be your dream job. And I'm not suggesting that it has to be. But I would suggest this, that if you go to work every day and you're pretty miserable, that's a sign. All right? It's a sign that something's going wrong for you. Not necessarily that it's a bad place for someone else, but are you in a place where you can be curious, where you can be happy, where you can serve the people around you? Are you in a place where you can contribute? Look for these things. Look for opportunities. And then, more importantly perhaps, I want you to consider, if you're not happy, why? If you're not happy today, ask yourself, why? What am I doing today that's preventing me from enjoying happiness? What am I doing today that's preventing me from thinking about other people? There's a lot of counterintuitive behaviors that we all exhibit, but oftentimes when I feel fear or when I feel angry, who am I really thinking about? Certainly not thinking about anyone else, am I? And we know from a neuroscience or a physical perspective that what happens when we get angry, the blood gets restricted going to my head. And when it gets restricted, the rational part of our brain goes away. Have you ever had to apologize afterwards and say, I don't know what I was saying, I apologize? Have you ever had to do that? Or backtrack and say, I don't know what I was thinking? Literally, the mind and the cognitive area of our space of our brain shuts down. 
because we're in the flight or fear perspective, which serves really no one but ourselves. Are you curious? Remain curious to remain humble. Some of the most powerful and amazing people I've ever met in my life could be arrogant beyond measure, and they weren't. There's a man called, his name is Vineet Nayar, and he works out of New Delhi, India. He wrote a book called Employees First, Customer Second. And I thought, well, that sounds like a nice line, but what do you mean by that? So while I was speaking in Bangalore one day, I emailed him and said, can I come meet you in Delhi? He happens to be one of the richest men of India. Famous, without a doubt. He spends time all the time with Jack Welch and Bill Gates, speaking at conferences all around the world. He's in Harvard and I mean, all the prestigious places he could be. And he said, absolutely, Max, come and meet me. So we spent an hour together, and Vineet Nayar is one of the most humble men and has every reason to be arrogant, but he's not. And I said, Vineet, how do you do this? And he goes, because I remain curious. I remain curious about the way I ask my questions and what I want to learn from others and what I want to do going forward. Finally, we talked about this calling, this calling that we're all going to be on this journey to figure out. Now, when I was 16, I knew that I would be a speaker the rest of my life. I kind of knew that this would be my calling. I didn't know how I would get there. When my wife and I were actually attending this school, we were actually ready to go for an internship, and we were telling this story a bit at lunch. I didn't even think about telling the story till now, so, and until we recited or shared it this morning. But we get to China to do a study abroad for a little bit. Now, this is back before the study abroad programs were so nice and lined up for how you could go and pick your package. And, they thought they had it all lined up, and it fell apart before our eyes. We ended up in China, not well, with no program. And I'd call back to BYU and say, now what do we do? There's no program. There's no, like, nothing happened that you said was supposed to happen. To make a long story short, we made the best of what we had. We lived in some crazy apartments that were not BYU approved. <laughs> <laughs> but we survived. But we survived. And five years later, we found it as one of the best experiences we ever had. Now, Part of it was because we were just on an adventure. We were willing to say, whatever happens, let's remain curious. And let's just go find and do things that will change us, that will challenge us, that will make us stronger and better people. And how do we do that? And how do we make sure we stay on purpose? Finally, I want to conclude with this. And then while it might seem a little bit trite when you first hear this word, please do not disregard it too quickly. Because it, here we might even talk about this word more than other campuses might. But... It's a word that I think we shouldn't take for granted, and the word really is compassion. See, in leadership, we often talk about being empathetic, right? Trying to feel for someone else or what they might be going through. But I don't think that's enough. Because just to know that someone's going through pain or that someone's going through a tough time really doesn't change the way I do anything about it. Compassion takes it to another level, however. See, because compassion says, I know what you're going through, and I'm also going to do something about it. I'm going to take action. I grew up in a household where my folks adopted eight kids. There were five older than that. So she had, my mom and dad had five kids first, and they adopted eight. Then they fostered 100 more. I'm the oldest of 13, six brothers and six sisters. That's the permanent United Nations seats. <laughs> my mom and dad taught me that if you see something and it's not right, do something about it. Be compassionate to do something about it. Know your calling. Be curious and stay curious. Because as you make more money and you inevitably get more titles and you get new opportunities in your life, the temptation to be selfish will be huge. I hope that this foundation you get at BYU will set you up for the rest of your life. In fact, I know a couple of my friends that came break from this program <laughs> and financially we have no problems. But they're also some of the most generous, most compassionate, and most willing people I've ever met as well. And I'm grateful to call them my best friends. Compassion begins with what you're going to do when you see something that's not right. How will you step up? Will you step up? Do you want some of these leadership positions? I'll tell you this, at Google, at Intel, or any of these other big companies that are looking for great talent right now. They are hiring, but they're hiring for people that can see beyond themselves. They're looking for people who have a tremendous ability to cooperate, to work well with others, 
to care about what's going on around them, and to be of service orientation. If you come out of here with that kind of mindset, not only will you be competitive, but you will rise through the ranks because of those who aren't there with you. And you will shine. But I hope you'll remember that as a leader, it's not about you, but about the people around you. It's not about bringing it out for yourself anymore, but about making those people around you as successful as you can be as well. <laughs> Finally this, do not get caught up in the blind spots. Now we all will, we all will because we all have blind spots. In fact, my own daughter exhibited or demonstrated this for me one day when I promised one day that I was going to be home and then I started doing something else. I made promises to be with her and her brother and then I started doing something else. Now, have you ever made a promise and then started doing something else? Please tell me I'm not the only one. Okay, there's a few of you in the room. Good, good, good. Yeah. So my daughter, I had made this promise. Now, my daughter came from China. She was two and a half years old when we adopted her. She had some skills that we actually weren't too fond of. She really knew how to hit really well. But her brother didn't think that was cool because he was the only brother at first, and now he was little brother. And he's like, man, who brought her home? Like, who invited her? And, and she knew how to hit really well. So her mom and I, we would always talk to her like, thank you for doing this or helping your mom or putting your shoes on right or thanks for listening. Thanks for taking care of your brother instead of killing him. You know, just little things, really. And then that day when I made a promise to her, I said, honey, today we're just going to play. And then I started doing email. And she goes, Daddy, I thought you said today we were going to play. And I said, yeah, honey, we're going to play. Just let me get this done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daddy, I thought you said today we were going to play. Yeah, 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 honey. Now, imagine if right then she would have walked away. Do you think I would have changed my behavior? Probably not. I would have just kept going because this is really important. More important than the promise I had made to my daughter. But instead, because she's really strong and she's really stubborn, <laughs> She got in my lap and she goes, Daddy, I thought you said today you were going to play. Would you please put that away? <laughs> I finally put it away. She goes, Dad, thanks for listening. <laughs> Folks, all of us are going to make mistakes. We know that. We've known that because of the gospel we've all been taught. We've known that we will all make mistakes and that we actually need a Savior in order for us to be able to go forward. But with that in mind, I invite you to consider the fact that when you get off track, find out how to get back on track fast. Be other focused. Don't be just about yourself. And you will be a better leader. You will serve. You will make money. You will have plenty for you and your family and plenty for those that you want to serve. I hope that you'll create an experience that you will lead and that you will care about the people around you by knowing your calling Staying grounded to that calling no matter what. Now, the path might take you in different places and in different jobs and in different geographies, but know your calling. Be curious and have compassion. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, so, we'll take some questions. Is that, that fair? So if there are questions, I'd be happy to take them. If it's about my baldness, I started at 19. I was losing my hair a long time ago. <laughs> please, any questions, please. Um, tell us more about how you decided to become a, a, speaker? Now, a speaker. Yeah, so I, I've been speaking since 1997. And um, uh, I was 16, right? And um, uh, I just I saw a video of Stephen Covey. And that was it. I just knew that that's what I would do the rest of my life. And so it was really a privilege, actually, two years ago when we both keynoted at the same conference. And I got to meet him. So that was a lot of fun. But I, I have to tell you that it has not been easy, and it's not an easy path. And um, if you want to do things, and you have a clear desire for what you want to do, a few of us were talking, John was talking earlier, and I love you have like, this clear, very clear path, and I just felt it. And I thought, if you have this path for you, be flexible enough that when the craziness happens, because it will in your life, be open to changing and modifying as you go, as long as it's still true to your calling. As long as it's still true to your calling. Is that fair? Is that answered a little bit better? Yeah. OK. If you want, we can talk more about it as well later if you'd like. But to study it as a, as a science, there's a lot of things you can do if, if, if this is specifically something you're interested in as well. Yeah, there's a lot of things you can do. Please. 
for that calling, how, how would be the best way to go about figuring out what that is? Thank you. Fantastic question. So, and I was told I should repeat the questions, right, which I didn't do earlier. So I will ask, so how did I know my calling of being a speaker was the first question, which I answered. And then the second question is, is really, so how do you know your calling? That's a great question. I would ask you this, what are the things you value? What are the things you value? And I would write them down. And I would begin with that and to say, what are the things I value? Now, the interesting thing about writing down your values is sometimes we actually deceive ourselves. We don't intentionally do so, but because we do have blind spots, we do these things to ourselves. So when you write these things down, what really helps is if you can actually go to people you trust and you say, hey, listen, check it out. These are the values that I think I value. What do you think? How do I come across when these values happen to me? And you can back check those things. Now, once you have values that are kind of defined for you, sit with them for a while. And your values might change as you go along. Or the words you use to describe yourself might change as you go along. In fact, I would guess that they probably will. But the calling doesn't change. The calling, might, you might change the words or the way you articulate it. But you know what that is in a different way. It's a higher level. Start with your values and know where those are. And then for those of us who believe in prayer, I would say get on your knees and confirm it. Thank you. Anything else? You know, we've traveled to some fascinating places around the world. It's awesome, fun. Who is your favorite person to meet? Oh my goodness, and I get to meet some really cool people. So um, I'm really grateful that I get to do that. I think, I don't know. What's that? Oh, repeat the question. Thank you. My wife is directing me. Thank you. She goes, yeah, I have to repeat the question. So who's one of the people I really, really liked meeting? I have to say, Vanit Yar stands out in my mind because of his humility and because of how fascinating he is. I, I have met with him, um, and I've actually spent time with one of the presidents of the United States and, and other people like that. But I think the people that fascinate me the most and the people I'm most drawn to are really humble about who they are. Um, and it's not about them. It's really not about them. It's really about the people around them. You ever met someone who just feels like the only person in the room is themselves? Are you in this room? <laughs> if you are, I would suggest that you consider quickly how you come across to others and how your leadership is impacted as a result of it. Because it will, it will be a detriment to you the rest of your life until you're willing to think bigger than yourself. And the biggest leaders, the best leaders, the most inspirational leaders, the people that are knocking it out of the parking industry are amazingly unselfish. Gary Kelly, the CEO of Southwest Airlines, comes to mind as well. Amazing individual, really cares about people. Doug Conant, the CEO of Campbell Soup, wrote a book called Touch Points. And he says, leadership happens in the, in the interruptions. How do you treat people when you're interrupted, when it's uncomfortable? Fascinating leader. And he likes to listen. I don't do hero worship, though. I don't do hero worship. I don't feel like I should have to worship anyone except for our Father in Heaven. And I don't worship leaders. I don't worship politicians. I respect them, and I consider them great people when they are on a noble purpose. Please, there's another question behind you, though. Please. Yeah. Oh, okay, so you said that you are going to give the same presentation to other companies, right? Yes. So how do you go about doing that? Do you still do it with the same kind of like church background? No. Great so, question. So how do I give this presentation without saying Jesus Christ uh -huh. or these kind of things? Or how do I mention things without being part of the church? And that's an interesting question because I've had a lot of opportunities to work with people who actually ask me all the time, what is your faith? In fact, we were with, um, and, and did I repeat the question properly there? I didn't, Sally. <laughs> Let me repeat the question for my wife who has now told me I did not repeat the question. So how do, I, how do I manage this message without, oh yes, yeah, so I did. Yeah, sorry, I did, I repeated it. <laughs> We've been married a long time now, so she's, you know, she got my back on. So yeah, how do we do this? Um, it, it's interesting, how do you set an example? When we lived in China, and even in China today, you're not allowed to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you could be a lifestyle missionary by the way you live. Right? You could be a lifestyle by the way you live. So what I do there is I'm very careful about how I talk. But it's interesting. When people start to feel the spirit, it doesn't matter what faith they come from. If they start to feel the spirit, they don't know why. 
but they just know that there's something bigger going on for them right then, and they know it's important. And, and so you can't, you can't conclude, you can't finish some of those feelings for people in a room, but you can comfortably be your full self in that room. And when we were doing this Parliament of World Religions conference in Barcelona, Spain, we were actually in a, in a monastery with 400 of the world's religious leaders. It was incredible. And we were one of the facilitators of this thing. In fact, I was going to grad school reading all these books about people and organizational behavior. And then I was on this facilitation team with most of the professors that I had studied. The books that I had read in grad school were now people I was working with. And it was incredibly humbling. And one day, we were sitting around at this dinner table. And I'll never forget it. Because I, every night, for two weeks in a row, I drank chocolate milk. And so they just you know, thought, they, we got this guy pegged. We said, they finally came up to me. They said, listen, there was like 15 of them there. And they said, listen, we think we know what faith you are. Your China background, we think you're a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, sir. No, sir. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they said, I will never think about the Mormons in a bad way again. And I thought that was one of the most sincere compliments I'd ever had. Now, I don't mean that I've always done it perfectly. There have been times when I was caught flat-footed. Not long ago, actually, uh, an officer of GE and I were having lunch. And uh, 350,000 employees, and he's one of the top 15. And he looked at me and he said, so what is it about you Mormons talking about Mitt Romney? And then he proceeded to ask me this question. And he totally caught me flat-footed. And I didn't have a good response. And I was embarrassed and I didn't. So I'm not saying that I have it always perfect, but I think that knowing your calling is it goes a long way to knowing what you would do in a situation like that to prepare yourself, to prepare yourself. Kind of a long answer to that. I don't mention the church in my presentations, but a lot of people will insinuate it based on what I say. Please. How many uh, times a year do you go around giving talks to many companies? Yeah, so I used to do about 125 presentations a year, which is nearly... 10 or 12 a month, three or four or five a week. And I just wasn't home ever. And now I still travel a lot, but I travel less. I specifically said I do 40 engagements a year, that's it. In fact, the reason why I'm here today is because of an alumni who happens to sit on a board who recommended this thing because of a GE presentation. Yeah, so I do 40 now, but that's just me personal. There are other people that you know teach their own, but it's, um, Particularly once we had kids, I knew that being on the road wasn't the whole answer. Please. So, why do these big companies come and ask you for help? I know, why, right? Why do they ask you? <laughs> I ask the same thing all the time. Why do these big companies ask me for help? I have no idea. No. <laughs> I think there's a couple things here, and one of them that has helped me a lot, and one thing that I try to stay really grounded in is that there are some really high name speakers out there. They command big speaking fees, they have big books and lots of stuff. But twice this year already, I've had two big companies that said they would never use the, a specific speaker again. And I, and I thought that was interesting. And they said the reason why is because he was too arrogant. He just thought it was about him. And I think my approach to the way I present to people is a little different, at least I hope it is. And so I'm very careful about how I articulate and how I, how I speak with people. I never want to patronize anyone in an audience. And I never want to ask them to do something that I think is just a time filler. So for me today to specifically ask you, what's your higher calling? That's a design that I wanted to put in because I didn't want, and I didn't want it to be a waste of time. I wanted it to be purposeful because today, regardless of whether you have that answer, would you at least think that later you'll be asking yourself, what is my higher calling? Questions have a profound impact that way. And so I like to ask a lot more questions than lectures. So I don't know. I consider that a blessing in my life. Thank you. Please, right here. Yeah. Man, great question. So if you feel like you're being selfish or arrogant, how can you change that attitude about yourself? That's first off, great power in just knowing where we're at. Okay. I know that if I start thinking just about myself, and if I start worrying about what people are thinking about me when I present then I start to become very selfish. And so what I do is I start to name drop, or I start to think about ways I can stand above my audience, right? And when I start to do that, I start to disconnect from people. So when I create a disconnection from people, I can feel it. 
you can almost feel the disconnect with people. Have you ever felt that disconnect when you just don't know why, but you feel the disconnect? And oftentimes it's because I've become so selfish or arrogant about myself that people just can't connect with me. Recognizing it's number one. And don't be afraid to say, hey, listen, I'm in a bad space here, and I've got to pull myself out. Number two, gratitude. And one of the best books on research on this is a book called Thanks by Dr. Robert Emmons out of UNC. No, out of U University of San Diego, I believe. Robert Emmons in a book called Thanks, and it's called The Science of Gratitude. <coughs> And by us expressing our gratitude, it's one of the only emotions in the human experience where we actually can only experience it by, by projecting it outward, by experiencing it with other people. And by experiencing it with other people, I start to realize that, hey, I'm not the only one here, and that, frankly, I will be blessed and better off if I recognize the people around me as well. Please, and then we'll go to the you, John, in the back. So please, yeah. Can you decide what to put in your personal reading list? Holy cow. Part of it is directed because we do a radio show. I have a, 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 we do a radio show. It's called realrecognitionradio.com. And we recognize and interview people on this show all the time. Um, it's free. I mean, I throw that out there because um, it's challenged me to look for incredible guests. So I read probably 10 to 20 books a month. And, and my library is getting ridiculous, as my wife would agree. <laughs> I have a lot of titles. So the problem with a lot of the books I read today is that a lot of them are repeating themselves, a lot of the same kind of stuff. So I'm looking for something specific, unique, that actually doesn't sound like just the normal business jargon. So one of my favorite books of last year was a book called The Happiness Advantage by Sean Aker. He's one of the most prolific and popular professors at Harvard for one of their freshman classes on why happiness is so important in our life. And The Happiness Advantage is one of those fantastic books and fantastic reads. So I skim a lot of books because I don't have time for garbage anymore. So, please, John. Uh, how did you get onto the track of lecture? Like, how, yeah. when you got your PhD in, in positional behavior? Just, a, I've only done my master's so far. I don't have a PhD, but I did, I followed up in organizational behavior and then, and then uh, did leadership coaching after that. Uh, I knew that this is the path I wanted to be on. And so for me, it was about putting myself in places where I would get that type of experience. When you first start, you do whatever people ask you. We, I mean, in China, we, we did outward bound, basically. We were doing, you know, taking people to pulling off the Great Wall, climbing and horse riding in Mongolia, uh, crazy stuff. But we were taking big clients like Mars and Cuba Packard and Schneider Electric on these incredible experiences. And then we were facilitating the dialogue about team building and how it felt after trust when you went off that wall and your colleague that you don't trust was holding the belay line. How'd that feel? <laughs> So that's how it started. And then we built some retail stores. So some, a friend and I, uh, I was traveling way too much, so we built 21 retail stores around the east coast of China. Uh, back in the 90s, this was a bad decision. You cannot compete with the Chinese when you want to pay all the taxes and don't want to pay any bribes. It's a really hard way to do business in China. And uh, we lost our shirts, but it was a lot of fun. And we learned a lot from the experience. And, and, and along the way, you just kind of do a bunch of things that try to put you back in your path, right? There have been a lot of things that have, I've just tried to find how to put myself back in that path. It's not a definitive answer, I know, and I appreciate that, but it is, it's a journey. And I would suggest to you this, that particularly now, you probably know this better than I do, that there really is no linear career path anymore. The hierarchy is gone, and in most organizations now, it is a very different way of moving up, and getting hired and getting organized for opportunities has changed. So don't be afraid of trying different things to diversify your skill set and getting a lot of experience. The most important thing with that would be to find an incredible leader in the organization you join so that you can be mentored by that person. One last question, then we'll call it a day. Yes. Man, so how do we work as a team? Because most of you will be in design situations or teaming environments or collaborative flat, flat um, hierarchies. Right? In organizations where no one's the boss, who's going to influence who? At Google, this is a huge question for them right now. How do I influence someone when I'm not their leader? But I need their cooperation. This is a huge, huge question. At Boeing, no, I'm sorry, not at Boeing, at GE, they have an aviation plant in Durham, North Carolina. And I've had the opportunity to tour this facility. They actually have a teaming environment where they just have to call each other out if they're not measuring up. They just trust each other that much. When those big jet engines come out that we all fly on on commercial jets, 
Those commercial jets have not had quality control by anyone except for the team who manufactured it. That's called teamwork, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> when they can put a label on a multi-million dollar engine and say, this thing's good to go with no extra quality control. So what you need to remember is how do I add value to this situation? When other people steal credit for your work, bite your tongue. When you're angry, hold off. If you're angry and you put it in an email, do not send it. <laughs> do not send it, you will regret it. In your social media, let me suggest one thing. Any of you active in social media, not just Facebook, but just other platforms, your, your, your potential recruiters and hires of the future will be searching and Googling your names. If they see derogatory comments, if they see that you're just focused on something all about you in your social media, it will impact your potential for being hired. And it will follow you forever. Social media should be a platform for promoting your brand. If you're on Twitter, and I, I'm very active on Twitter, um, I, I often say the last 10 tweets in your stream really reflect who you are. So who are you? The most successful people in social media, which this still lines up, and indulge me for a moment, but this still lines up. In social media, if you want to be successful in a platform, and I would suggest this relates to leadership as well, be more generous, be more giving, be more and less about yourself. The people in social media that are all about themselves, throwing stuff about themselves all the time, are not generating a lot of traction. They're not generating a lot of traction. So be more generous. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I can promise you there's going to be days when you say, oh my word, this is not what I signed up for. And I have a brother-in-law who actually went through this program and has been with some really bad bosses out there on the design floors and designing and engineering and, and creating. And now he works with an incredible firm and he travels the world uh, uh, in, um, in building these uh, dome structures and architecture. But it was something completely different from what he actually said here. He wasn't even prepared for it. Originally, he was actually designing uh, tables, these plastic tables over here in a local company right here in Provo or, or close by. Yeah. Is that fair? Was it fun? I hope it was fun. I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you for letting me be here again. Thank you. Thank you.